Hello, everybody. This is Drew Wilde here. I'm about to deliver the seventh uh, installment of the webinar series Beyond Dry Needling. Uh, if you, by any chance, are having difficulty with video or uh, sound, possibly the best thing to do is to log out and log back in. Uh, welcome to viewers around the world, viewers and listeners. Uh, we have um, people tuning in from Qatar, from Pakistan, uh, from Lebanon, and many from the US. Greetings to, to you all. Um, so you probably gathered by my accent that I'm not from around the US. I live just outside of Boston, but I'm actually from New Zealand. So I call myself a Kiwi. And uh oh, a little technical difficulty. My mouse is working better now. Um, so if you go to New Zealand and you ask for a Kiwi, uh, you won't find that you get offered any of these because we don't call them Kiwis in New Zealand. We call them Kiwi fruit. This is a Kiwi, a, a little flightless nocturnal bird. And that's what New Zealanders are named after. So where do I come from? Well, uh, I've put myself uh, as a student with some of the top uh, people, teachers in the world and presenters and book writers and uh, researchers. Uh, so on the left hand side there, you can see Travell and Simons, the um, mother and father of uh, my official trigger points. I never got to meet Janet Travell, but I did get to meet David Simons when he visited New Zealand. And then we have the next generation after Travell and Simons, which is uh, Jan Domerholt, who I, uh, I'm very uh, happy to have as a friend and a mentor, and Dr. Gerwin, and they have taught me very well, hopefully. Uh, the middle column is the neuromuscular therapy column. And so the founder of neuromuscular therapy, Raymond Nimmo, he was a kind of a disaffected chiropractor, who figured out that bones didn't move bones and so became very much interested in soft tissue. And he taught Paul St. John and he and Paul St. John taught Judy Delaney and I've studied with both of them. Uh, on the right hand side, that's the European side. So you have uh, Varma who came from India and set up in the UK and he uh, taught and worked in the UK with Boris Chato and Stanley Leaf, and eventually with Boris's nephew, Leon, who passed uh, two years ago, very sadly. And so here's my clinic room, which I miss a lot. I'm 10 weeks into lockdown, which means the last time I worked on anybody was March 18th. So I hope I can remember how to do it when I finally get back there. I think we're due back on June 8th, I think there's going to be the end of lockdown here in Massachusetts. Uh, despite that, yesterday we had 40 brand new deaths, but that's the lowest total for a couple of months now. So uh, my stats there, uh, 26 is how many years I've been uh, doing this job. And 46 is the number of weeks a year that I work. And 16, believe it or not, is the number of people maximum that I treat in a week. So there's my total there, 19136. So when people ask me what's my line, I have to start off by saying I'm a licensed massage therapist because that's my base training here in Massachusetts. But I'm also a twice certified neuromuscular therapist and a twice certified trigger point therapist. And my elevator speech, my 15 seconds would be that I attempt to remove pain and dysfunction derived from soft tissue, mostly using touch. Well, what is touch? And so I'm just going to make a little adjustment here to get rid of my box that is blocking some of the wording there. Lovely. Um, so touch, I've got gotten these um, definitions all, up, all over the place, Miriam Webster and also this lovely book called Touch by David Linden. So to bring a bodily part into contact to handle or feel with the intent to understand, to put hands upon any way or degree, uh, the interface between our bodies and the outside world is touch. And then 
according to David Linden, to extract basic sensory information and to register its particular emotional content. So getting a bit more complicated here, we have these afferent fibers, four types of them. Uh, we have the A alphas, the A betas, the A deltas, and the, uh, the C fibers. Linden has broken this down into a first wave of nociception when things are painful or unpleasant, and a second wave of nociception. So the first wave comprises the A alphas, the A betas, and the A deltas. And so the A alphas are most, mostly for proprioception. Uh, they're very heavily myelinated. The A betas, for light touch, are also thickly myelinated and can travel, their messages can travel at 150 miles per hour. The A delta fibers are also fast, but they're not quite as heavily myelinated. They're traveling at almost half that speed at 70 miles per hour. And then you have the second wave nociception uh, via the C fibers. These are the unmyelinated fibers, and their size is small and their speed is slow, two miles an hour. So you've got super highways, you've got highways, and you've got dirt roads, basically. There are two parallel pathways of nociception that Linden has identified. So the first part is the fast sensory discriminant discriminative, and that's going via the spinothalamic tract. And then you have the second power, parallel pathway, which is the slow affective emotional pathway. And this is uh, traveling up the spinal cord via the spinomesencephalic tract. There's a mouthful. So touch, how do we know that touch is reliable? If one person feels something in the tissue, um, can another person feel the same thing in the tissue? And it turns out that good inter-rater reliability of myofascial trigger points in tissue, when performed by well-trained and experienced uh, clinicians, it has been provable by research. So we have these five studies here, Gerwin back in 97, Schiotti, Bron, Myberg, and Mora Relucio, excuse me on the pronunciation, and a couple of recent ones. These are from 2017. Uh, the first one from Belgium here, De Groef, I hope I'm pronouncing that. Um, very ambitious because they compared the rate of palpation reliability in nine muscles. So from upper trap, you can see on the, the top of the right-hand column there, um, upper trap, levator scapula, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, teres major and minor, subscapularis, pectoralis major, and the scalene muscles. So that's, that's a lot of hard muscles to work on. So, and they found that there was moderate agreement. So that's, that's actually pretty good. Uh, but supraspinatus there, um, that was not, that was only fair. Trapezius was excellent, almost perfect. Uh, a second study also published in 2017 out of Madrid, Mayoral del Moral. And in this study, they chose to work, to compare the, the work of two experienced examiners um, working on or palpating 10 bilateral muscles uh, from the upper quarter. And they found that the inter-examiner uh, reliability was very good. So those are two more recent studies. So here's, here's something that's been bugging me for quite a while. I've never come across an author who has put together all the words that we could use and use in an inter-rater way to describe what we're feeling in the tissue. And so it may be out there and I just haven't come across it, but I do have a, an extensive library. The most common word when you press on something and you ask them what they feel, this is your patient, your client, the number one word they say is tight. How did they learn that? I don't know where that word came from. To, to me, tight is a measure, a measured word. So tight means the muscle is short and tight and measures uh, short and tight with passive roll. But there are all these other words out there 
that I use when people ask me what I'm feeling. Does the feeling tissue feel dense? Is there some kind of densification to it? A hardness, a hypertone, uh, some kind of resistance that is abnormal. Gelosis they use in Europe a lot, which I like that word. Myogelosis meaning in the tissue. And Ryan last week talked about glycosaminoglycans and connective tissue. Um, so yes, that's the buildup was going from a soul state to a gel state. Induration was a word that Leon Chato pushed for all his life and no one took it on. And the opposite of induration, I would, I would believe, would be boggy or something like that. Uh, but there can be resistance to shear forces in many different directions. The, the tissue may have bits of roundedness inside it. It may feel band-like or stringy or ropey. Um, there may be discrete nodules. In the case of a trigger point, we would want to look for a discrete nodule. It may be fascicular, lenticular, or completely unremarkable. So we don't really have consensus on this, but it's, it's something that interests me a lot to get a language that we can use that's universally accepted and it, it explains the same thing. The problem is, of course, that muscles come in all shapes and sizes, all lengths, breadths, and depths. So when we're applying pressure on a particular tissue, uh, we first encounter the superficial parts of it, and then the middle parts of it, and, and then the deeper parts of it, and that could, they could all be different. So there's many different shapes and sizes to contend with here. So the summary here, this is a little cartoon showing you the summary. So the, we've got this light touch, non-noxious, traveling along the purple neuron, which is the A-beta fiber. We can have some noxious mechanical stimulus, that's the hammer there, and that's firing on the A-delta fiber. And then we have the thermal and the chemical, and that will be um, firing along the C fiber. Right, now we're going to get into the um, into some more painful uh, parts of what we do. So we know the classical definition from IASP. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience uh, associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And that's all very good. But when you explore a bit more and they have their official uh, list of pain terms, there's some glaring omissions in my mind as a manual trigger point therapist. So I don't see myofascial pain there, and I certainly don't see trigger point there. So they're, in, they're, they're uh, not taking into account all the work that we do. Right, let's break down pain into acute and chronic. So acute pain is pain that is easily understood. You bang your elbow against the door jam, you rub it for a period of time and using kind of form of gate control, uh, by the time you stop rubbing, the pain has gone away. So back in 2018, I made two trips to California to teach manual trigger point therapy there. And uh, Lindsay Clark there, you see on the list on the left there, uh, she was the one who uh, brought my work to California. And soon after I started uh, lecturing, they said to me, you do know why you're here, don't you? And I said, yes. And they said, well, we're all physical therapists working in the emergency department. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'd never considered that we could do that, but I, was, I taught the way I usually teach. And so a month after the first visit there, I uh, emailed Lindsay and I said, how's it all going? And she said, it's going very well. So um, here's a study that came out last year uh, by Casey Grover, who's the medical director there. A traumatic back pain due to quadratus lumborum spasm treated by physical therapy with manual trigger point therapy in the emergency department. This is great. So this is the case. It's a 42-year-old female. Uh, she presented to the emergency department with a traumatic back pain. Uh, they thought her pain was myofascial, so they got a PT in to do a consult. And he, he agreed. He found that the quadratus lumborum was in spasm. He treated her using manual trigger point therapy, completely relieved her pain without requiring any medications, 
That's great. So the conclusion there is that manual trigger point therapy can provide non-opioid pain relief in ED patients and physical therapists can apply this technique effectively in the emergency department. So we love that. Now, that's a, that was acute pain. What about chronic pain? That's a different ballgame. So I read this book last year. I liked it a lot. I came across this quote by Professor Irene Tracy from a prestigious hospital in Oxford, the John Radcliffe. Chronic pain has no purpose. It's a system gone wrong, like cancer. Many types of chronic pain are diseases in their own right, something quite separate from acute pain. Yay, I agree. I also like the work of Lewis Gifford, who wrote three, uh, a trilogy uh, called Aches and Pains, very seldom seen on any bookshelves. Um, so he's the inventor of a model that he calls the mature organism model. So his belief is that everything below the brain stem is just messaging and signaling. And the brain has to make sense of this. So it scrutinizes the information to make an output of some kind. Uh, so along the way, it has to sample itself, uh, including past experiences, knowledge, beliefs, culture, past successful behaviors, and past successful behaviors in others. So the brain, the brain has what we call the neuromatrix, and it's got all these parts to it. The anterior cingulate cortex, primary sensory cortex, thalamus, anterior insula, prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal cortices, and the amygdala. So that all together is called what they call the neuromatrix. In 2015, David Butler came to Boston and he was telling us all about the neuromatrix and neurotags and all this stuff. On the exact weekend that he was teaching us here in Boston, uh, Lorimer Mosley published something uh, at, which said, it is not just the brain that changes itself. It's time to embrace bioplasticity. Right. So he's saying, moving on from positions of prejudice first requires understanding. And I have slowly come to understand that pain is not an emergent property of the uh, neural system, but of the human itself. This National Geographic came out in January 2020, and I didn't learn much from it. Here's what they say about acute versus chronic. When, while acute pain signals follow ascending pathways to the brain, chronic pain, such as persistent back pain, is due to damaged neurons or axons. Its pathways are not well understood. Well, that part I agree with. Let's now spend the rest of this webinar talking about what we know about trigger points, the current information, how to identify them, how to treat them, and how to get people out of pain. I'm going to show this slide at the very end of the workshop, and I'll give you that time to think about what the connection might be here between Yoko Ono and a trigger point. So think about that. Some of you may have seen this slide before, but what does a trigger point have in common with Yoko Ono? You'll see the slide again. So there are classic trigger point definitions. Uh, a trigger point is, hyper, is a hyper irritable spot in a skeletal muscle that is associated with a hypersensitive helpful nodule within a torque band. And that little sentence has stood the test of time. Uh, the spot is painful lung compression, and can refer pain or other sensory symptoms such as paresthesia to a zone of reference. It can also cause motor dysfunction and autonomic phenomenon in the region of reference. So if you want to learn how to be a good uh, manual trigger point therapist, you better surround yourself with the best people. And that's what I did in 2007. I studied uh, in Bethesda with Myopain seminars. 
and you're part of that system right now with this webinar. The third edition of Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction uh, came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and what uh, intrigued me was a panel on the back cover, which said, prepare for massage therapy practice with this updated edition of the definitive source of information related to pain points. Wow, that's great. Now the authors, original authors were both MDs and now the new um, generation of authors are all physical therapists. But it's, there's a, a, a lot of information in the new edition. So here's a quote from Cesar Fernandez de las Penas and I can feel his frustration when he wrote this. The main observed deficiency in most clinical practice guidelines of low back pain is the lack of inclusion of myofascial trigger points, not so, so much in Monterey anymore, uh, as a possible source of the patient's symptoms or as a contributing factor to movement impairments uh, and nociceptive pain mechanisms, psychosocial aspects, and the contextual meaning for the patient. Here's another resource that I find very, very useful. Uh, this came out last year. Uh, it's a, a manual trigger point therapy according to Roland Gauchy, who um, is Swiss and worked with and studied under Biat de Jung. Uh, but the forward got me here with uh, Siegfried Mensa, a very famous researcher. Uh, this comprehensive book deals with practically all aspects of myofascial trigger points from the as yet imperfectly understood pathophysiology uh, uh, to the actual practical treat therapy. A lot of information. One of the techniques I've not heard of before, uh, Roland calls the ignition key technique. And basically what you do is you do a pincer palpation, let's say of sternocleidomastoid, and then you twist it like you're turning a key in the ignition. And unfortunately, I only just became aware of this technique and I haven't really had a chance to play around with it because of my lockdown for the last 10 weeks. The fourth and last piece of uh, vital trigger point research uh, resource is this muscle manual written by Dr. Nikita Visniak from British Columbia in Canada. And we recommend this one because it's like a little mini pocketbook travel and science. Uh, you may have noticed it was spiral bound, which means when you open it up, it sits flat on your desk, on your table. And so each page is just like this for each muscle. So at the top uh, left-hand corner here, you see the anatomy and physiology side of things. You see the clinical notes. Uh, you see how to palpate it. You see the muscle testing. I'm not sure if I would test my patients that way. Uh, you see the, the trigger point referral patterns. And then you see the home care activities here as well. So that's for each muscle. Uh, I'm actually on the advisory board for him uh, for checking for um, mistakes and things. Um, so now let's talk about the course that I put together and teach. So uh, starting in 2009, when I was um, very happy and surprised to be asked to um, take over the manual trigger point course. Um, so what I put together, took a while to figure out the, the format, but what I put together are three three-day uh, workshops, uh, and I managed to find 170 palpable muscles. These are unilateral muscles. So um, 170 pal palpable muscles, we have to get through that in seven days. Uh, a variety of approaches are used, and I'm, I'm gonna run through that. And, and what it took me a little while to figure out is how to sort of organize the courses. So I am a big fan of Vladimir Yanda, uh, and so he was the man who sort of put together the tonic phasic groupings of muscles, many different ways to group muscles. Tonic uh, muscles tend to get short and tight and phasic muscles tend to get inhibited and weak. So what I did was group as many of the tonic muscles as I could to go into NTT1 and as many of the phasic muscles to go into NTT2. So there's six days worth there. And then in NTT3, the last one, you have to do one and two before you can do three, uh, was the left 
leftover muscles of the neck and the jaw and the cranium. And, and inside that NTT3, you would do a review day and you would also test out with a practical and a theory. So the 170 muscles, what we have to do for these 170 muscles is start off with an assessment of some kind. And so physical therapists are very good at assessment. My assessment as a licensed massage therapist is going to be pretty basic. Um, we're going to do try to identify the trigger point and then we're going to attempt to deactivate the trigger point. Uh, we're going to meet some confirmation criteria that I'll, I'll show you on the, the next slide. And then as a neuromuscular therapist, I've always got some lotion nearby and I would do some deep longitudinal stroking after I've done the trigger point deactivation. Uh, reinforcement techniques, lots of those stretches, local and global stretches, uh, pin and stretch, um, whatever you like that can be part of that reinforcement. Um, I'm chatting to my people the whole way through, so there's some pain science education, what's going on, what I'm attempting to do. And then the, the reassessment, the, the reassessment is, is very important because it, it puts a picture in their mind that they've made some kind of gain. So uh, compared to the assessment, the reassessment, I'm hoping, um, provides some uh, diminution of pain or some uh, extra range of motion. And then that will be followed by a home care activity to, as a handout. And then we also need to identify, modify, or remove the perpetuating factors. And I've got more to come on that. So let's go into the trigger point confirmation. And so uh, this was a Delphi study published back in 2018. Cesar Fernandez de las Penas and uh, Jan Domerholt. And pretty much what they wanted to know from 60 uh, experienced people, they wanted to, to know what the consensus was on the diagnostic criteria and clinical considerations of myofascial trigger points. And so 60 experts from 12 countries around the world, and I was very happy to be one of those 60. Uh, so the overall agreement, 84% was uh, consensus, a uh, pretty good consensus, was that yes, the torque band is the most important thing to figure out or to go searching for. Uh, and then the exquisitely tender spot, 77%. And then the classic referred pain, which is superseding what used to be the patient's recognition of their familiar pain. Uh, the talk band you can find without help, but to identify an exquisitely tender spot, you have to have a communication process. So you cannot feel their tenderness. The same with the classic referred pain. You have to have communication for those last two. So the, this is the communication process I teach in class and use in, pra in practice. Um, so set up some pressure pain scales. One is very light touch. 10 is very painful touch. Therapeutic range we'd use to treat is six to seven out of 10. Uh, we're gonna set up a patient-centered uh, precision of helping us find the exact location uh, by saying, do I need to go left? Do I need to go right? Do I need to go up? Do I need to go down? Uh, and then we want to find something that uh, replicates their familiar pain. It's difficult for some people to handle, but to solve their pain case, I have to be able to reproduce their pain. Uh, hopefully at the end, their pain is less. Uh, then you ask, do they, uh, can they feel any uh, referred pain zones, the RPZs there? referred pain zones. And then the most important thing, of course, is to get feedback on the diminution of pain. Has your pain gone down? That's most important. Right, here's another important question. How long do I press? And this is different around the world. There are people who study with Bonnie Pruden who believe seven seconds is all you need. The Nimo people, five to seven seconds repeated. Uh, when I first came here and taught neuromuscular therapy for Judy Delaney, uh, it was eight to 12 seconds. When I studied with Jan and uh, Dr. Gerwin in 
2007, the standing joke in myopane seminars was 13 and a half seconds. Um, research has been published by WHO on uh, using high pressure for 30 seconds to advantage. Uh, Simons likes the 60 seconds barrier release and who also believed that low pressure for 90 seconds can work just as well as high pressure for 30 seconds. Some of the uh, DOs will use up to two minutes and some of the STECO group will use up to five minutes. So that's a big um, space, seven seconds through to five minutes. Uh, that's, that's quite a lot of variation. So this is one study by Terry Koo published maybe 10 years ago and one of the only studies to uh, research the NIMO receptor tonus technique on muscle elasticity, pain perception, and disability in subjects with chronic low back pain. So the objectives were to, one, uh, quantify the immediate effect of the NIMO technique on muscle elasticity, pain perception, and disability, and two, to evaluate comparative effectiveness, effectiveness of treating all primary and secondary treatments versus just primary. So the, this is the method, uh, prior effluage of posterior glute med, so it's just the one muscle that they're working on, uh, or the one muscle that they're testing. Uh, the muscle's placed in a relaxed position, there's your five to seven seconds, repeated many times, and then you go away and you leave it to simmer, and address the satellite areas. And most of the satellite areas are, in fact, um, the antagonist muscles. Uh, so, and then that was repeated uh, in several cycles, three cycles, uh, finishing with a full joint range of motion and ascertain the, the end view. And this is what they concluded. This is one single session of the NIMO uh, receptor tonus technique, uh, appears to reduce muscle tone, subjective pain, and disability, and be more beneficial than focal trigger point treatment. So that's the Journal of Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics back in 2011. So there are other questions that I get asked all the time. And so what would be your answers to some of these questions? What duration for each session? So I have sessions that last 30 minutes up to I've um, recently done a, a treatment for two and a half hours. And then how frequent should they be? Well, this, because I'm, uh, I don't take insurance, cash-based business, um, this depends on how much money people have got in their wallets a lot. Uh, how many sessions in total? That's always a good question. How many trigger point locations per session should I treat without over-treating? And how much discomfort should I impart in the session? Well, that's a very totally subjective proposition. To answer all those questions, it's a very subjective thing. Every person is different, so there'll be a different answer for each person. But what we will do is use some evidence-informed uh, medicine. And so evidence-informed medicine involves integrating the best available uh, external scientific evidence with individual clinicians, judgments, expertise, and clinical decision making. This book here, How Healing Works, I think every med student should be required to read this before graduating. This is a lovely book written by Dr. Wayne Jonas. He believes that 20% of the results he gets in his clinic um, happen in his clinic, and 80% happens once the patient leaves because there are a lot of pain perpetuators out there that once they leave your clinic, they're exposed to. So here's Leon's um, expression that I have committed to heart. We have to identify, modify, and or remove the perpetuating factors because there's lots of them. I'm not gonna go through this. I'm aware of the time and I don't want to run over, but you'll be aware of all these things and you'll get to see the slide presentation when it's published. Um, so exacerbators, GI dysfunction, breathing pattern disorders, insomnia, so on and so on. So now we're going to just have a look at the, my method of teaching uh, MTT 1 and 2 and 3. And as I said, I'm a fan of Vladimir Yander. 
So MDT1 focuses on the muscles that he puts in the upper crust and lower crust syndromes. And you'll see here MTT1, the tonic muscles, postural muscles, the ones that keep us upright, can work all day long. They're older, they're mostly flexors, they tend to tighten, they tend towards early activation, less atrophy, less fragile, mostly one joint, and they're pretty much the type one or slow twitch fibers. Uh, last week, Ryan talked about glycosaminoglycans and uh, intramuscular connective tissue. So this is Peter Perslow's work where he um, digested the um, muscle protein and left behind just the connective tissue. And what I want to bring to note here is that the type 1 fibers tend to have more intramuscular connective tissue, more than type 2. So when you look at this cartoon, uh, these are very commonly injured muscles. These are ones we work on a lot. So these are all the type 1 muscles. And if you look at their arrangement, you'll see that they'll, they're very good to keep us nice and upright. So the therapy that we're going to use for those muscles, predominantly the one-minute uh, pressure point release advocated by uh, David Simons. We do flat palpation to begin, we do pincer palpation. For the flat palpation, the expression I use is to push past, as you can see top left, and pull back and find it on the way back. So this is transverse to the fiber direction here. Uh, for the pincer palpation, grab more than you need and then let it slip and try to palpate that taut band within that muscle. So here's MTT2 muscles, so basic muscles. They are the younger muscles, they're mostly extensors. They tend to weaken and lengthen. They can have a delayed activation. They tend to atrophy, they're more fragile. They're multi-joint muscles and mostly tight to fast twitch muscles. So those are the muscles you'll see on the narrow uh, bar, that weak rhomboid serratus, weak deep neck flexors, weak glute max and weak abdominal muscles. And for that, we want to wake these muscles up. So we're going to use compression with active contraction. So reasonable pressure, uh, get a small active muscle contraction. So if you're holding your own biceps right at this very minute, the small muscle contraction, you do flat palpation, find a taut band, and then you just do pronation and supination. And of course, biceps is firing up for supination. Uh, relocate and repeat and return, come back three times use your reinforcement techniques, heat and stretch, and we nickname this technique COCO, compression with active contraction becomes COCO. So here's the cartoon showing that you've got your finger pressure on the, on the contracture, the trigger point nodule, uh, and you're asking for a voluntary contraction. The torque bands on either side are being woken up and you get the job done maybe twice as fast. Want to bring this to your attention as well. Uh, this is Yanda and Jal, Gwendolyn Jal from Australia, uh, their stratification syndrome. Uh, so uh, the dark pink areas are the areas that tend to shorten and tighten, and the light pink areas tend to weaken and lengthen. And this little research paper I have down there by uh, Henry Pollard back uh, 1997, he broke, he, he had a bunch of healthy people that he tested their straight leg race. So he's checking for hamstring length. Uh, one group got uh, work on their neck, one group got work on their hamstrings, and the other group was some kind of placebo group or um, control group. Guess what? The hamstring only group improved their straight leg raise by 8%, and those that got the cervical muscles worked on improved their straight leg raise by 13%. I have done this in workshops and it works every single time. Some of the more unusual muscles that we treat in uh, MTT, uh, internal work on the medial and lateral pterygoids, fabulous work. Uh, I've added iliocapsularis since last year. This, this is a muscle that was identified in 
2000, and I'll talk about that a bit more later on. Uh, we also treat the superfer uh, superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle, uh, the obturator externus muscle pressing directly on the obturator foramen. Lovely work that we do on longus poli, longus capitis, tibialis posterior that can't be needled. So manual therapy for that is very important. But going back to uh, these groups of muscles, these muscles are the muscles that we work on the most. If you go through and look at those, I want you to identify iliopsoas here, because that's what we're going to focus on right now. Uh, so th this is going to be the, the, the last bit of the lecture. Uh, the assessment could be for iliopsoas, the, the Thomas test. I like to do it in sideline, but you can do it any which way you want, modified Thomas, Thomas test. We're going to use a technique called falling leaves, and I've got photos coming up to show you that. We're going to do some kind of trigger point um, deactivation, which will simply be a heel lift. Uh, we'll use some reinforcement techniques. I have a lovely pin and stretch technique to show you. And then we'll reassess and hopefully improve. And then I'll go home with a kneeling hip extension, uh, home care activity that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So iliac is first. So the upper two thirds of the iliac fossa, common tendinous insertion with the psoas major muscle at the lesser trochanter, the distal end. Hip flexion, it's a very good hip flexor. It's a single joint muscle. Uh, can also be involved with some kind of anterior pelvic rotation, which we try to reduce as well. Branches of the femoral nerve. Psoas, so the psoas is interesting. Psoas, can attach all the way up to the 12th thoracic and all the lumbar uh, vertebral bodies, but also the intervertebral discs, uh, the anterior and the inferior portions of the lumbar transverse processes. And then it passes over the sacroiliac joint to merge with iliacus. So its number one function we believe now is lumbar stabilization. It's also involved with hip and trunk flexion, a little bit of lateral flexion, some adduction, and also part of the anterior pelvic rotation. Um, here's what's interesting, that uh, the innervation is different front and back. So the anterior portion of the muscle has femoral nerve branches L2 through 4, and the uh, posterior has the ventral rami spinal nerves. So here's some interesting bits and bobs of psoas. So we've just seen it has an anterior and a posterior division by innervation. Uh, it can be considered um, a unipennate muscle. You can just see here that tendon here. So unipennate means like half a feather. Um, the upper muscle uh, has more type one fibers. The lower muscle has more type two fibers. So you would, that would make you believe that the type one fibers are postural and the type two are um, phasic. And so the more the upper fiber has more roll to blade stabilizing the lumbar spine. Um, I also came across the fact that it's twice as thick in black people. Not sure what the reason for that is. And in flexion, psoas is most efficient between 45 degrees and 65 degrees. So here's the combined common pain patterns. So key muscles in low back pain, groin pain, and anterior thigh pain. And you want to take care palpating the uh, psoas on the um, left side because that's where the abdominal aorta passes along. Uh, treatment would also include quadratus lumborum and the abdominal obliques. Uh, but also consider tensor fascia lata, rectus femoris, pectineus, and sartorius. Right, so here's the first of the technique uh, photos. Notice the patient's leg is um, flexed. And I've inserted my own knee underneath so that the leg is completely relaxed on my own. Uh, I've hooked my uh, fingers into the iliac fossa, one hand on top of the other. And to ascertain muscle movement, I'm, all I'm going to say is just press down on the ball of your foot or lift your heel. And that way I'll get a sense of the muscle contracting. So we don't get too deep here, but we can get deeper by have a look at the bottom left photo. The knees have rotated across to the right-hand side. 
which has kind of pushed my fingers out a bit. But when they rotate across to the left hand side, I can sink a lot deeper into that muscle, access along uh, a lot, as much of the muscle as I can down towards the uh, inguinal ligament. So that's iliacus. You can also do this technique standing on the, the other side and use your thumbs. That's a, another very nice way of doing it. Um, so it's now. So top left, you'll see I've got one hand on top of the other. And what I'm going to do is employ this technique of falling leaves. And falling leaves is just pushing the abdominal contents out of the way and going deeper with each falling leaf. Um, get the heel lift again to make sure you're on the muscle. So my start position there is a sort of a halfway a line between the umbilicus and the ASIS. And it's just lateral to the rectus abdominis. In the middle photo at the top there, uh, that's the start position for a pin and stretch that I'm going to do. So I'm just using a single hand. I'm guiding the knee to uh, show them that I want them to straighten their leg. And if you look at the, the uh, photo on the right side, that I've, I've maintained contact. So it's a pin and stretch. I've kept the, kept the contact on the muscle as the muscle has been drawn into length. The two photos on the bottom row there are rotating the leg into external rotation and pushing my hand forward towards the midline. And with that, I'm trying to access as much of the medial side of the muscle as I can. And then I rotate the leg into internal rotation and I draw my hand back and I'm trying to access as much of the lateral part of the muscle as I can. Then we want to treat the common uh, tendon attachment on the lesser trochanter. And so see my right hand there, the top left photo, that's my measuring device. That's the Texas Longhorn, I've been told. That's about a four inch uh, distance from the AIIS to a point midway on the thigh. The leg of the patient is in the favor position, flexion, abduction, external rotation. And then I'm going to press down in the photo you can see on the top right there. And to get some muscle contraction, you can see with the photo on the bottom, uh, I'm going to get the patient to lift their right shoulder just half an inch off the table. And that will get a diagonal sling mechanism going from the right shoulder to the inside of the left leg. And that uh, tendon and the muscle above it will pop into my fingertips very nicely. I showed you this photo before, but didn't explain too much about it on the left-hand side there. This is to show you this muscle iliocapsularis. And so this was at uh, the NAM TPT conference. Stuart Hines from Australia brought it to our attention. And I've been using this technique ever since. So my, the technique is a prolonged, uh, sustained pressure for up to four minutes, maybe longer sometimes. So you want to get yourself in a very comfortable position for this. Uh, I'm using the elbow of my elbow and forearm of my left arm, but I'm also pushing down on it with my right arm to sustain that pressure even better. The stretch employed can be on the table like so, so assisted stretch on the table. Note that the unaffected uh, knee is up to 90 degrees at least to stop the low back going into um, extension. And then the two photos on the right are the kneeling uh, hip flexor stretch. And the things to note for these are, see how the knee migrates uh, from the top picture forward over the ankle. And the very last thing that I'm going to instruct is that the, the person then does a tailbone tuck, which means they take themselves into a posterior pelvic rotation. All right, so just to summarize, we've got three three-day workshops. Uh, we've just seen two muscles, so we've only got 168 palpable muscles to go. Oh, actually, no, there was the iliocapsular, uh, so we've got 167 palpable muscles to go. Uh, you're going to study hard, uh, and then you're going to uh, attend a theory test, 75 multi-choice questions, and a practical test of four muscles drawn at random. Uh, there's all the materials that you will need to pass this exam to get a certificate.
and add some more letters after your name, CMTPT. Just to make you uh, aware, and uh, Mary, I know you're listening. Uh, this is the uh, National Association of Myofascial Trigger Point Therapists, fabulous group of people. Uh, pretty much always have a, an annual conference, but not this year. Uh, lots of information on the website and a uh, um, lovely group of very talented people belong to this association. All right, back to our burning question. What does a trigger point and Yoko Ono have in common? So you'll have to know a little Beatles history to know the answer to this. Um, so Yoko Ono became the girlfriend of John Lennon and that created a lot of tension in the band. Sorry. So there's me, I've done my trigger point therapy approach. Uh, next week we'll be bridging the gap, musculoskeletal and sports to men's health. And then we've got with uh, Gerard Green, Blair Green, a lot of greens, uh, dry needling for pelvic pain and dysfunction, Colleen White Ford, orthopedics and pelvic health and external perspective, Jan Domholt on whiplash, one of his favorite subjects. Uh, Harry von Pikatz is going to uh, tell us all about Brooksism, and then Michael True, who I've studied with as well. Um, he's going to present on tinnitus, which, which is one of my favorite subjects. So these are every Tuesday. I hope you tune in for those. Uh, there's also in the future a plan to do a live chat with my pain instructors, getting to the point, coming back soon. And then one other favor to ask. So this is a free webinar and it's going to be posted. Um, it's being recorded. It's going to be posted. It's still going to be free. And yet, if you were nice, you might want to consider making a small donation to No Kid Hungry. So uh, My Pain Seminars is raising money uh, to connect kids in need with nutritious food and teaches their family how to cook healthy, affordable meals. Uh, the campaign also engages the public to make ending child hunger a national priority and any donation will uh, make an impact. So My Pain and all our instructors, thank you in advance for your contribution to this course. And that means a lot to us. Right. So, who's still awake? Uh, I'm gonna go down and bring up my drop down menu and see if there are any questions. And go through them one by one. And so the, uh, you know what? I might have to put on my cheaters for this. Will this PowerPoint presentation be available? The answer to that is yes, Jason. This will be available. And uh, was this presentation recorded? And will it be available? Yes, once again. And then Mary B, how does a heel lift work as a trigger point deactivation technique for the service? It, it's just a small activation process. I, I kid you not, it does work. You could you could use a foot slide, which is a little bit more difficult for them to perform, but anything that um, activates the psoas, but not in a full flexion way is uh, my method for that. Uh, for the MTT courses, uh, the tests on the last day, or do you come back at another time after the three days for testing? Yes, I didn't explain that that well. So on the last MTT3, uh, day one is all muscles. We cover, I think, 40 odd muscles that we have to deal with in one day there. Um, and then on day two of that, MTT3 is a review day where I basically give you the answers to every single question because the next day on Sunday, you come back and there's the theory test in the morning, 75 uh, multi-choice questions. And uh, then the, in the afternoon, four muscles drawn at random from a, from a small list that I'll hand out to you in advance. So Lauren, I hope that answers your question there. Uh, can you combine trigger point and dry needling? Oh, yes, Cheryl, you really can. Um, 
I know this because I work with Erica Bourne a lot. Uh, she's a colleague of mine here. She's, uh, she was doing dry needling, but not so much anymore. But she was a, she was a fabulous therapist and did great work by combining the manual and the, and the dry needle. Uh, Amber, nice to hear from you. Uh, could we see the slide with the pain exacerbators again? Well, that'll be on the recorded presentation. So the answer to that is yes, but if you email me in private, I can send you that anytime at all. Uh, here's one from Trina. Do you know if there will be any animal specific courses available online as webinars? Uh, so you are a registered vet tech in Canada and was hoping uh, Rick Wall might offer something because we cannot come to him in Texas anymore. Oh, hopefully that won't last forever. But um, so yes, I think there are canine ones. I'm not sure if it's part of the series coming, uh, um, canine or equine, but they're all very valuable. Um, what I could have done was put a photo of a shark being dry needled in Australia, believe it or not. Um, that was a published study of a shark in trouble in Australia, swimming in circles, and they took it out, dry needled it, and its dorsal fin popped up, and it was a happy shark again after dry needling. That's a true story. Uh, oh, somebody else saying thank you, and and also and here we go, Caressa. Which trigger points would you recommend treating for somebody who experiences tingling in the thumb and uh, inflammation? in the carpometacarpal joints. Um, well, um, I would go for everything. And I would start quite a long way off. I would start with brachialis and uh, brachioradialis and um, supinator and pronator teres. These all have the ability to fire things down into the base of the thumb, especially. And so, um, Pain and tingling quite often go together, but at the same time, you know, the tingling might need to be looked at first by a doctor if it persists to rule out any neurological uh, contributions to that. As far as the uh, carpometacarpal joints, um, anything that crosses that joint, and so that would be any of the, the, the superficial muscles, the flexors, the extensors, and the, and the um, deep muscles as well. Here's something from Rabia, I think it is. Thank you. I uh, wanted to ask you if iliocapsulitis is present in every adult, and how do you know that that's the cause of pain? And we should go for the prolonged four-minute technique. Well, I'm telling you this secondhand. Uh, Stu Hines, who brought this to my attention, he lives in Victoria in Melbourne. I had never heard of this muscle until, what was it, September last year. And while he was teaching, I was looking online uh, to find it, and there it was. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, so where's it been hiding all this time? Um, really don't know the uh, uh, answer to your question. Should we go on for four minutes? I've just been taught it that way, uh, and I've only been working that technique since September myself. But it seems to be, and, and Stu Hines uh, was a massage therapist for the Australian Olympic team, the field hockey team. And there's a lot of uh, hip flexion in field hockey. He was the, uh, the Olympic uh, therapist for years and years and years, many, many different Olympics. Um, he, he has uh, lovely stuff on his website. I'm not sure exactly what the website is called, but Stu Hines, S-T-U, not as opposed to my name. Uh, and so he has recommended the four minute technique. Caressa telling me CMC joint, thena eminence, all the local muscles, but uh, global muscles as well for those uh, parts of the body. So it's castral net wide. Do you use uh, or integrate German connective tissue massage for uh, myofascial uh, deactivation? Absolutely do. That's from uh, Vladimir. And so, yes, I got taught connective tissue massage, beginner webs, is that how you say it? Uh, I like it a lot. I, I often start my treatment with that uh, lifting technique and I find it's, it really speeds the process up. So that's a definite yes to connective tissue massage. 
tibialis posterior trigger points can be tested, uh, treated manually, and can be helpful, uh, and can it help activate the muscle? Absolutely. Uh, so Jan Domholt has decided not to uh, teach needling of tibialis posterior anymore because the neurovascular bundles are all over the place down there and you never know that you're going to be able to avoid them. Uh, in the manual techniques that we use in prone and supine are uh, dynamite. So yes, that's going to be very helpful. Uh, it's, a, it's a much overlooked muscle and it you know, really has a, an important role to play with um, pronation and supination. I think I've got to the end of my questions. Look, one minute past six, the clock just struck six. I want to thank you for your attention and I hope I've answered all the questions and I wish you well in this virtual world that we seem to be living in these days. One day, wouldn't it be nice to all meet up in person under the same roof? So thank you for your attention and don't forget kids in hunger. Thank you. Bye-bye.